So we have with us Jeffrey William Hunt, who is the director of Texas Military Forces Museum, which is the official museum of the Texas National Guard in Austin, Texas. And he's also an adjunct professor of history at Austin Community College, where he has taught since 1988. And previously, he served for many years as the curator of collections and the director of the Living History Program at the Admiral Nimitz National Museum of the Pacific War in Fredericksburg, Texas. I've actually been to that museum. And uh, Jeff holds a bachelor's degree in government and a master's in history, both from the University of Texas at Austin. He's the author of several books, including the critically acclaimed and prize-winning Need and Lee After Gettysburg, The Forgotten Final Stage of the Gettysburg Campaign, and then also Meade and Lee at Bristow Station, The Problems of Command and Strategy After Gettysburg. So taking up here tonight, uh, he'll be focusing on Meade and Lee at Rappahannock Station. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over to our guest author. All right, well, get, get, get this up. Uh, really, really delighted to, to be with all of you. Uh, greetings from the capital of Texas. Uh, what you see over my shoulder is part of our uh, Civil War exhibit uh, at the Texas Military Forces uh, Museum. If you ever get down Austin Way, uh, come visit us. We're, we're free and, and open to the public. It's a 26,000 square foot exhibit, uh, and we would, we would love to have you uh, come, come visit. Uh, tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about the, the third book in, in my Mead and Lee series, uh, the story of uh, Mead and Lee at Rappahannock Station, which, would, uh, co which constitutes the first real offensive action of the Army of the Potomac uh, after uh, the, the Battle of, of Gettysburg. And so very quickly to kind of get, get us up to speed uh, where we need to be, uh, in a lot of history books, uh, the period between Lee's retreat across the uh, Potomac uh, on July uh, 13th of 1863 and the opening of Grant's Overland Campaign with the, the Battle of the Wilderness in May of 1864 uh, is uh, a, a, a giant void. Uh, and the, the historians and history books tend to fast forward uh, through the second half of 1863, uh, you know, uh, making some uh, generalized commentary about, well, not much happened, the armies maneuvered a lot, and, and, and they didn't fight. Uh, all of the attention swings westward to the dramatic battles of Chick uh, Chickamauga and the fighting around Chattanooga, uh, and it's as though for half of a year, uh, two of the most important, two of the most famous armies of the Civil War uh, basically just sat down and licked their wounds, that so they didn't do anything until Grant showed up and initiated the Overland Campaign. Uh, even if you stop and think about it for a moment, this is completely unlikely, uh, and of course it is utterly untrue. There was a great deal of activity uh, that took place in Virginia uh, between Lee's crossing of the Potomac uh, and the, the onset of winter quarters uh, in December of 1863. And of course, the Gettysburg campaign itself uh, didn't end when Lee retreated across the Potomac. He fell back into the upper Shenandoah Valley. Uh, a few days later, Meade crossed the river into the Loudoun Valley, putting himself on the strategic flank uh, of the Army of Northern Virginia with the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, between them. Uh, and for the next 10 days, uh, the two generals uh, engaged in a battle of wits as Meade tried to keep Lee trapped in the uh, upper, or rather the, the lower uh, Shenandoah Valley, uh, and Lee sought to get through the gaps uh, in the Blue Ridge Mountains and return to uh, Central Virginia, where he could take up a blocking position uh, behind the upper Rappahannock in Culpeper County. And a, a lot of maneuvering, uh, a lot of intelligence gathering, a pretty sharp fight, uh, in Manassas Gap, and Lee managed to elude Meade uh, and get back to Culpeper County. Uh, Meade followed him, uh, uh, but before Meade could try and push Lee away from the Upper Rappahannock, uh, Lincoln ordered him to detach 9,200 troops uh, to enforce conscription in the North, and uh, for as a consequence of that, uh, for six weeks, uh, Lee, Meade uh, was basically frozen in place. Uh, during those six weeks, both the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac managed to fully recover 
from the Gettysburg campaign so that by the time you get to the start of September of 1863, the two armies are back to the same strength they had enjoyed on July 1st uh, when the Battle of Gettysburg uh, began. Uh, Lee was very anxious to resume the offensive uh, and uh, especially as Union troops in the West came closer and closer to Knoxville and, and Chattanooga, uh, he got permission from Jefferson Davis to undertake an offensive uh, against Meade. Uh, but before that offensive could be launched, uh, Knoxville and Chattanooga fell to the Federals. Uh, the decision was made to send most of Longstreet's Corps West to reinforce uh, Bragg. Uh, and uh, when Longstreet's Corps disappeared, uh, when rumblings of that soon reached Washington, uh, Meade was told to uh, move forward and find out what was going on. So he plunged into Culpeper County in mid-September of 1863. And after a very savage cavalry battle around Culpeper Courthouse, uh, he managed to confirm that the, the rebel army was behind the heavily fortified Rapidan and that Longstreet was gone. Uh, and before Meade could figure out how to take advantage of that, of course, the Battle of Chickamauga is fought. Uh, and uh, and uh, the federal suffer a horrible defeat, retreat back into uh, the city of Chattanooga, uh, at which point uh, Lincoln orders me to send his 11th and 12th Corps west uh, to redeem the situation in Chattanooga. And although the troops who had been sent north to enforce the draft came back to the Army of the Potomac at about the same time, so that numerically speaking, the transfer of the 11th and the, the 12th Corps didn't make much of a difference uh, to me, psychologically it meant a great deal. And he believed he no longer had the strength uh, to try and fight his way over the Rapidan. Uh, Lee uh, took advantage of Meade's uh, stalling, uh, launched an offensive in early October uh, the so-called Bristow Station campaign uh, that drove the Federals uh, all the way back uh, to Centerville. Uh, Lee had hoped that he would uh, hit uh, the Union Army on the move uh, and find some way to damage a, a good part of it, but uh, Meade had retreated too swiftly and too skillfully. Uh, so the only really big fight uh, was the rear guard action at Bristow Station where the Confederates suffered a bloody nose. Uh, and after that, the Federals were in the defenses around Centerville uh, and behind Bull Run, and Lee recognized that his campaign had run its course. Uh, it would do no good to outflank the Federals again because they would simply fall back into the defenses of Washington where the Confederates couldn't hurt them. And although Lee uh, would have liked to have hovered near the Potomac, uh, logistically this was impossible. The northern part of Virginia had been stripped bare by two years of war, and the anemic Confederate supply system wouldn't be able to, to feed uh, the Army of Northern Virginia uh, that far north. Uh, so Lee had decided uh, to pull back uh, toward uh, the, uh, the upper Rappahannock. Uh, and uh, Jeb Stewart's cavalry administered a, a licking to the Federals at uh, Buckland Mills uh, during the retreat. Uh, but basically, uh, the Confederates are, are, are pulling back uh, to uh, where they were uh, almost where they were at the start uh, of the Bristow Station campaign. And that brings us to uh, the story of Rappahannock Station. Uh, and uh, one of the important prerequisites uh, to this campaign is to understand that as Lee pulled back uh, along the line of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which you see right here, uh, his troops utterly destroyed the railroad. They burned all the stations, burned all the bridges, destroyed all the culverts, uh, chopped down the telephone poles and uh, burned all the cross ties and warped the rails on, on top of uh, those, uh, those flaming pyres uh, of cross ties. And uh, Lee did this deliberately because he knew uh, that Meade could not advance uh, without the railroad because the ONA, which runs all the way up to Alexandria on the Potomac, uh, was the primary supply line for the Army uh, under George Meade. And without that supply line, that army could not be fed. Uh, and so Meade could pursue Lee only at the pace of railroad repairs, uh, which would take at least a month and perhaps longer. And Meade uh, might find that by the time those repairs were close enough to the Rappahannock uh, for his army to launch an offensive, there wasn't enough good le weather left in 1863 to really do anything. Uh, that, that was really unlikely. Uh, that was kind of a best case scenario. But nonetheless, uh, this is uh, going to slow Meade down. It's going to take almost a month 
uh, for the ONA uh, to be uh, repaired. And so it's going to be early November uh, before uh, the, the federals have a supply line uh, that is going to enable them uh, to try and deal with Lee uh, in the position that he has taken up. Now, where is Lee? Uh, Lee did not retreat all the way to the Rapidan uh, following uh, his, uh, his misfortune at Bristow Station. Instead, he had fallen back to the upper Rappahannock, which you see right here, which constitutes the northern and eastern boundary of Culpeper County. Uh, so his army is mostly north of Culpeper Courthouse, which is in the center of the county, uh, with Hills Corps west of the ONA, guarding the army's flank along with uh, Fitzley's cavalry, uh, Ewell's Corps to the east of the railroad uh, and, and guarding that sector. The Federals uh, advance slowly uh, as the railroad repairs uh, proceed, uh, but by the beginning of November, the 5th or so, uh, they're on the line of the Warrenton Junction Railroad. So they're between Warrenton and Warrenton Junction with, of course, the federal cavalry uh, spread out uh, in front of them. And so this is the position of the armies uh, as we get to the beginning of what will become uh, the Rappahannock Station uh, campaign. Now, uh, the Confederate general had decided to do something that was actually pretty daring. He decided to occupy Culpeper County. Culpeper County, which is right in the middle uh, of the theater of war, it's, it's equidistant between Richmond and Washington, D.C., had been marched over, camped on, and fought over uh, throughout most of 1862 and a good chunk uh, of 1863. Uh, Culpeper County, uh, as I pointed out, has the upper Rappahannock as its northern and eastern border, and it has the Rapidan River as its southern border uh, with the, the small and diminutive Robinson River uh, making up most of its western uh, extent. Uh, so if you look on a map, uh, Culpeper is sort of like a sideways V uh, formed by these rivers. I refer to it as the Culpeper V with Culpeper Courthouse right in uh, the middle. Uh, the Orange and Alexandria comes in from uh, the northeast, uh, crosses uh, the Rappahannock, or at least it used to, at Rappahannock Station, goes to Culpeper, and at that point the railroad turns due south, uh, where it crosses the Rapidan at Rapidan Station, goes to the Orange Courthouse, and eventually uh, links up with the Virginia Central at Gordonsville. The Virginia Central runs west of the Shenandoah Valley and east to Hanover Junction, where it connects uh, with the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad that leads you uh, to Richmond. So this railroad uh, network is very important. Uh, it, the ONA is Lee's primary supply line, and it's also Meade's primary uh, supply line. Now, this distance between the rivers is not great. It's only 23 miles if you uh, travel down the uh, Orange and Alexandria. Uh, and the difficulty with keeping your army in Culpeper Courthouse was that although it was a good offensive jumping off point for a Confederate army that wanted to march toward the Loudoun or, or the Shenandoah Valley to invade the North, uh, it's uh, a very bad defensive position for whoever holds it, uh, largely because although this is a very beautiful part of Virginia, uh, it doesn't have much in the way of good defensive terrain. There's not a good spot to anchor the flanks of a battle line. And of course, uh, the closer you get to the apex of the county where the Rapidan flows into the upper Rappahannock, the narrower the county uh, gets. And although the roads are good, uh, these rivers uh, are problematic. Uh, neither one of them is especially wide. Neither one of them is particularly deep, but both of them could flood very rapidly after uh, a decent sized uh, storm. Uh, and there were only bridges in a couple of places. And that was namely at Rappahannock Station and Rapidan Station where the railroad crossed the, the two streams. Uh, there were plenty of fords along these rivers but the difficulty uh, with the fords uh, was that, of course, they could disappear very quickly if, if there was rain upstream. And the other problem with defending the, uh, the Culpeper V for Lee is that the ground on the north side of the upper Rappahannock was generally much higher 
than the ground inside Culpeper County. Now, the same is true if you go to the Rapidan, the, the, the ground south of the Rapidan is generally higher than the ground north of the Rapidan. And that means that anybody who's inside Culpeper County is sort of in a bowl, right? That the enemy, you know, on higher ground. And tactically, that was problematic and strategically it was problematic because that would allow the enemy to either mass his forces out of sight preparatory to trying to lunge across one of these fords, or it would allow the Federals to do what they had done at the start of the Fredericksburg campaign, because this is basically where the two armies were uh, when McClellan leaves uh, in October of 62 and Burnside takes over. They're, they're basically in this same spot. Uh, the Federals could take control of the upper Rappahannox Ford, uh, use that high ground to shield a rapid march to the southeast to Fredericksburg, and if they could get across the river before the Confederates could intervene, uh, the, the rebels would have to abandon the upper Rappahannock and the Rapidan as a line of defense and fall back all the way to the North Anna before they could find good ground uh, to make a stand in, in front of Richmond. And of course, this is what Burnside had tried to do uh, in November uh, of 1862, and it almost worked. Uh, he, he got a march on Lee, but of course, we all know the story that pontoon bridges didn't show up on time. Lee got to Fredericksburg in front of them, uh, and then the Union debacle uh, that uh, December. Lee was acutely aware that this could happen again if he stayed uh, in Culpeper, and he was also aware that if the enemy crossed the river uh, and forced him to fight in Culpeper, uh, he would not only have bad ground on which to make that fight, uh, but if he was defeated, his army would have to retreat across these fords. And those fords were natural bottlenecks that would slow down any retreat. And if the enemy was pursuing aggressively, uh, he was going to probably maul some part of uh, the Confederate army before it reached the south bank of the Rapidan. And so for all of these reasons, Culpeper seemed like a very bad place to defend, uh, and, and Lee understood this. And he also understood uh, that the Union Army under George Meade uh, really had three options to try and deal with a Confederate force inside Culpeper uh, County. It could do one of three things, the least likely of which would be to swing far to the west through Madison County with the intention of either coming in to Culpeper from the open end of its feet to attack the Confederates inside the county or to try and give them the slip and get across the Rapidan uh, to strike at Gordonsville. The, the problem with this threat is that if the Federals try to do this, two things, Lee's in a position in Culpeper County to march out and interdict them. And secondly, they would have to let go of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad as a supply line and rely on wagon trains, which is naturally, that's not a very inviting uh, prospect. So although the Yankees might do that, the, the likelihood is that's not a, a real option. Uh, there is the Fredericksburg Gambit uh, that is very dangerous potentially to the Confederates. And then there is of course the possibility that the Federals would attack straight across the river into the teeth uh, of the rebel defenses. Uh, so these are Meade's three possibilities, and Lee has to figure out how to counter them uh, if he's going to stay in Culpeper. Now, he had the option, of course, to retreat below the Rapidan, where he had better defensive ground, but that would surrender all of the gains he had made in the Bristow campaign, which he was reluctant to do. It would surrender 25 miles of ground to the Federals uh, without uh, a fight, put them that much closer to Richmond, that much closer to the Virginia Central Railroad. Uh, and even if Lee spreads his army out for 25 miles along the Rapidan, he's not gonna be able to cover all of the fords. And so the Federals could slip past his flank by Germana and Ely's Ford. And Lee's only response would be to come rushing from west to east to try and interdict them uh, before they tried to get between him and Richmond, or they turn to attack him uh, and attempt to the structure of his army piecemeal. Uh, if this looks familiar to you, this is basically the Mine Run campaign that's going to happen in December and the, the uh, Wilderness campaign that's going to happen in May. But Lee didn't like this because it put him in a reactionary stance. Uh, if he stayed in Culpeper, not only would he be able to interdict any federal move to the west, 
He could also, through a daring strategy, stop any federal attempt to settle down toward Fredericksburg to the east. In fact, if he stays here, he has the chance to assume an offensive defensive, that is to force Meade into a trap. And so what Lee's basic plan is, is the, to accept the fact that the Federals would get across the upper Rappahannock uh, at some point, most likely Kelly's Ford right here where high ground bluffs on the east side of the river uh, dominate the opposite bank, uh, but to force me to divide his army to get across here by maintaining at Rappahannock Station a bridgehead, a fortified bridgehead on the north bank of the river. And what that bridgehead would force me to do is to split his force because if Meade attempts to go to Fredericksburg or he attempts to cross the Rappahannock, from this fortified bridgehead, the Confederates could launch a counterattack that would strike the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and put the Army of Northern Virginia between the Federals and any march on Fredericksburg. Uh, and so by holding that bridgehead, Lee would make it impossible for Meade to make that Fredericksburg move. And if the Federals then wanted to attempt to cross the Rappahannock, they would have to divide their army, keeping enough troops in front of Rappahannock Station to either try and crush the bridgehead or at least contain it uh, and prevent a Confederate counterattack from spilling out of it, while the other half of the army crossed the river at Kelly's Ford. And what Lee's plan is, is to let half Meade's army cross at Kelly's Ford hold the other half of Meade's army at Rappahannock Station, courtesy of his fortifications and with minimal force, and then throw the weight of the Army of Northern Virginia against whatever portion of the Army of the Potomac had crossed at Kelly's Ford, attack it with its back to a river only a couple miles distance, defeat it, drive it into the upper Rappahannock, and either wreck it or destroy it. And so by deciding to hold this bridge in here, at Rappahannock Station, Lee has concocted a way to render moot the disadvantages of holding uh, his army inside uh, Culpeper County. Now, Meade, naturally, uh, is not uh, ignorant of this. He understands uh, Lee's strategy, he understands it very well, and he believes that the only way to avoid walking into the Confederate trap uh, is to make a move toward Fredericksburg. In fact, this is something that he has wanted to do uh, ever since the army returned to the Upper Rappahannock at, at the end of the Gettysburg campaign at the beginning uh, of August. Lincoln and Stanton and Halleck had vetoed that plan. They did like the idea of sending the Army of Northern, uh, the Army of the Potomac back to the scene of its worst defeat, uh, especially uh, in, in August and September when you're just a few months away uh, from congressional elections. That seemed like a really uh, bad move politically and an admission of strategic bankruptcy. Uh, they believed that the job of the Army of the Potomac was to go out and fight Lee's army wherever it was with the aim of its destruction. And they argued that that would be no easier to do around Fredericksburg than it would be to do uh, around Culpeper Courthouse. Meade naturally argued uh, from an opposite point of view. And he pointed out that the Orange and Alexandria ran all the way to the Potomac through Confederate territory, through territory infested with rebel guerrillas like John Mosby. And the only way to ensure that that railroad supply line remained intact was to put so many troops along the track that the Confederate guerrillas could not disrupt the ONA. Uh, and that could only be done with infantry, and it meant that thousands, thousands and thousands of AOP soldiers uh, would be wasted guarding railroad track. Uh, and this would weaken the combat power uh, of the uh, Army of the Potomac uh, and make it that much more difficult to tackle Lee successfully. Uh, and the other thing that's bothering George Meade is that he is aware that every battle that's been fought in this war especially in Virginia, has been bloodier than the battle before it. He's seen the Army of the Potomac shrink and shrink and shrink as the casualties get higher and higher and higher. 
He's seen most of the two-year enlistments expire and those soldiers go home. Uh, he's seen the draft riots. He does not believe that the draft is successful. Uh, it's not bringing in the kind of soldiers that the union needs to prosecute the war. He doesn't believe it will bring in the number of soldiers that are needed to successfully prosecute the war. Uh, and therefore, union strength must be husbanded. Uh, we, we're, we think of the North as having this massive numerical advantage uh, over the Confederates of it is sort of looking backward from the end of the war. If you stand uh, in the fall of 1863, uh, the North is suffering something of a manpower crisis. The, the draft has not really begun to be productive yet. Uh, and Meade believes that if he goes out and he keeps fighting these battles and suffers these tremendous casualties, uh, especially uh, since he expects the Confederates henceforth are going to be fighting from behind fortifications and, and earthworks, that uh, he's going to waste a lot of irreplaceable manpower. Uh, why not, uh, rather than attack the enemy frontally, outmaneuver him, force him to give up strong positions like the Rapidan and the Upper Rappahannock uh, and maneuver him closer to Richmond where you potentially could have a final uh, decisive uh, showdown. So he doesn't want to fight his way across the Rappahannock. He doesn't want to then, uh, if he's successful in doing that, have to fight his way across the Rapidan. The move to Fredericksburg makes sense. Uh, not only because it will avoid bloody battles that can be avoided, but also if he goes to Fredericksburg, he can shift his line of communication away from the ONA to a Kia Landing, which is on the lower Potomac. And there's only 15 miles of railroad between a Kia Landing uh, and Fredericksburg. And of course, 15 miles of railroad is much cheaper to defend than nearly 50 miles of railroad. And that would leave the Army of the Potomac that much stronger. Uh, after the Confederate uh, success in outflanking the Union Army in October, uh, Meade believes that he is, his point has been proven uh, to Lincoln and Halleck, that the, the, the ONA is a really bad line of advance. It, it's too easy for the Confederates to defend. Let me go uh, to Fredericksburg. And so uh, anticipating that they have learned their lesson, uh, on November 2nd, he begins to issue orders uh, to his army to prepare for that southeastward slide toward Fredericksburg. And of course, if he's going to let go of the ONA, uh, then it doesn't matter what Lee does from his Rappahannock Station fortifications, the ONA won't matter anymore. Uh, having made his plan and believing that this is the best plan, the best strategy that he can execute, uh, he sends word to Halleck this is what I'm about to do. Uh, let me know uh, if, if this is not okay. And to Meade's great distress, uh, within 24 hours, the word comes back from Halleck, no, it's not okay. Lincoln and I said in August, you cannot do this. We're not going to let you do this. We have not changed our mind. Uh, and this is incredibly uh, depressing uh, to Meade, who, who really has a kind of tepid relationship uh, with his bosses in Washington and has had uh, ever since uh, the, the Confederates had slipped across the Potomac uh, following uh, Gettysburg. In fact, on several occasions, he's offered to resign, suggested that they ought to replace him if they're not happy. Uh, of course, replacing the victor of Gettysburg is easier said than done. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Meade is very frustrated. He knows that Lincoln and Halleck want him to fight. Uh, but he also suspects that uh, they're very anxious to keep their fingerprints off any reverse. Uh, they're setting him up to be a scapegoat if things don't work right. And they're not giving him the flexibility necessary uh, to fight to an advantage. And when he finds out that he's not going to be allowed to make his preferred move, he writes to his wife, Margaret, on November 3rd, uh, bemoaning the fact that his plan has been disapproved. And what does that mean? It means that uh, his best option is off the table. He's got to come up with a second plan. Uh, and that second plan uh, is basically to do the very thing that Robert E. Lee wants him to do, to launch an attack directly across the upper Rappahannock. Uh, and now Lee's strategy of that bridgehead at Rappahannock Station is going to play its dividends because uh, Meade has to contain that bridgehead, or he has to destroy that bridgehead, and he's got to put sufficient force in place to do that while the rest of the army attempts to cross the river at Kelly's Ford. So Meade decides to divide his army, just as Lee predicted that he would. He puts the right wing under the command of Major General 
John Sedgwick, who is the senior major general uh, in the Army of the Potomac. He's going to have his uh, own sixth corps and George Sykes fifth corps, uh, 26,000 men plus artillery. The left wing of the army is going to go to Major General uh, William French, who is the second highest ranking major general in the Union Army. Uh, and he's going to have the first, second, and third corps, uh, 29,000 uh, men. Uh, and uh, with the army divided, uh, Meade is going to advance quickly, hopefully surprising the rebels, with the 5th and the 6th Corps converging in front of Rappahannock Station, the 3rd Corps followed by the 2nd moving on Kelly's Ford, uh, the 1st Corps coming down to Morrisville, uh, where it's going to uh, wait in reserve, uh, go in either direction, but probably toward uh, Kelly's Ford. Uh, federal Cavalry will mass on the flanks, Buford to the west, Kilpatrick to the east, uh, Greg's division will guard the supply trains and the reserve artillery that will mass around uh, Morrisville. And what Meade wants to do is to have both Sedgwick's wing and French's wing fight their way across the Rappahannock simultaneously, because this is really the only way to foil Lee's plan. Uh, Meade understands Lee's going to let him cross at Kelly's Ford. In fact, geographically, he can't stop him from crossing at Kelly's Ford. But Lee intends those Federals to walk into a trap, to let them get far enough away from the river uh, to become vulnerable to an overwhelming counterattack by the bulk of the Army of Northern Virginia, throwing almost 100% of his force on at best 50% of Meade's force and, and winning a decisive victory. Uh, while the other half of the Union Army is stymied in front of Rappahannock Station's fortifications. But if Sedgwick could take those fortifications and force his way across the river at the same time that French is crossing, these two halves of the Union Army could link up at Brandy Station, and then they would be in a position to compel Lee to fight on disadvantageous ground in Culpeper County, where any defeat would force him into a desperate retreat across the Rapidan uh, with a good chance that the Union Army, if it pursued intelligently and aggressively, could catch the rebels before they uh, crossed to the South Bank and, uh, if not destroy them, do enormous uh, damage. And so that is Meade's plan. It is the only plan that he has left that is viable, uh, but he's not happy about it. And he writes his wife, on the evening before he launches this offensive, uh, that uh, that he is in a state of high anxiety. Uh, in fact, he, he's not fit to write. He tries not to write. He's miserable. Uh, he's being forced into an operation that he, uh, he doesn't want to undertake. He's not being given the flexibility uh, that he thinks that he should have. Uh, he's, he's miserable as commander of the Army of the Potomac. He wishes he'd never taken the, the job. Uh, and uh, he's not really sanguine uh, about the possibility of this plan working. Uh, and if it doesn't work, he doesn't know what he's going to do next. Uh, but one thing about George Meade is that he's loyal, uh, he's dutiful, and he's thoroughly professional. And so he doesn't go into this half-hearted uh, like a lot of generals would if their preferred plan had been vetoed. Uh, he lays his is scheme out carefully to subordinates. He gives them adequate force. Uh, he's got to do everything he can to make this work, even though he's afraid that he is indeed walking into a rebel uh, trap. Uh, so uh, the Union Army on the morning of November 7th begins to move. And this is a surprise to the men of both sides. The federal soldiers believed that they were on the verge of being put into winter quarters. Uh, they were very disappointed uh, when instead they're given orders to march once again for the Rappahannock, which they had crossed many, many times before. Uh, the Confederates inside the Culpeper V are also convinced uh, that the campaign is over for the season, and they're busily building uh, winter quarters and troops scattered all over the county, you know, getting wood uh, for building cabins and firewood and, and this sort of thing. The courtesy of the high ground north of the Rappahannock, Meade manages to achieve strategic surprise. And the Confederates are not going to become aware that the Federals are, are nearing the Rappahannock until almost 11 o'clock uh, that morning uh, when troops at Rappahannock Station catch a glimpse of French's columns marching toward 
uh, Kelly's Ford and the little town nearby called Kellysville, uh, which is going to see the scene uh, be the scene uh, of, of the first action uh, of uh, the day. So uh, Kellysville, Kelly's Ford uh, is a uh, a very vulnerable spot. And so here's the little map. It's uh, this is where the high ground is that would allow federal artillery to dominate the South Bank. The Confederates have fortifications at Kelly's Ford, uh, which would be sufficient to stop a minor pro, uh, but it's not going to stop a major assault. And Lee knows this. And so the, the main defenders of Kelly's Ford, Robert Rhodes Division, are about a mile back from the river. Uh, the troops closest are uh, the 30th North Carolina, uh, which is uh, uh, back here. Uh, in uh, in these woods with 500 men supported by uh, Captain John Massey Sluvanna artillery with six guns. And then you've got 225 men, seven companies of the second North Carolina under Lieutenant Colonel William Stallings that's along the river. Now these troops uh, are part of Ramsher's brigade, uh, but Ramsher, Stephen Ramsher is left to get married. Uh, and so this, the second North Carolina's Colonel, Colonel Cox, is in command of the brigade, uh, and that puts Lieutenant Colonel Stallings in command of the troops uh, here at the fort. He's got uh, a company here at Wheatley's Ford, and he's got two more companies uh, to the south uh, at another Ford. Uh, so this is really kind of just a trip wire. Uh, and the job uh, of Stallings is to delay, uh, to buy time, uh, to, to give Rhodes uh, an opportunity to form a line of battle for Edward Johnson's division uh, to come to road support uh, so that the whatever Federals cross at Kelly's Ford can be contained uh, until the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia can come up uh, to launch uh, a counterattack. Uh, so if the Federals want to cross the river at Kelly's Ford, uh, there's nothing that's going to uh, stop them. And here is the proof of the pudding, if you will. This is a sketch made by Alfred Rode uh, during the Battle of Kelly's Ford. So this is the high ground that I was pointing out a little to uh, the south of Kellysville. So here's Kellysville down here. There's the wood line uh, where the 30th North Carolina is. There's a little Confederate uh, 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 redoubt uh, for artillery that's right here. But you can see the Union guns are basically looking down on all of this and control everything, the Ford, the town, the 700 yards of open field uh, between uh, that rebel Confederate uh, earthwork uh, and, and Kellysville uh, itself. So once the Yankees get their artillery up here, uh, this, this thing is, is pretty much decided. It's just a matter of how long uh, it's going uh, to take. And uh, in fact, it only took about two hours uh, from the moment that the federal skirmishers first showed up uh, and initiated the battle. Uh, they, uh, the rebel uh, skirmishers opened fire, quickly fell back across the river uh, Stallings puts uh, his three companies into the earthworks, four other companies on this little uh, hillock here. Uh, but when the Federals got artillery up here, uh, these men were forced to withdraw into Kellysville. And at that point, the Federal Third Corps, uh, which is under the command of David Burney today, while French is running uh, the left wing, uh, pushes down toward Kelly's Ford with Regis Trobian's uh, brigade in the front and the uh, first and second U.S. sharpshooters uh, as the spearhead. But when the Federals tried to cross the river, the Confederates put down such a hot fire, uh, they forced the Federals to take cover. And at that point, uh, the Yankees bring up a, another battery of artillery. So they've got 18 guns and they're pounding these Confederate positions. And they're pounding Kellysville uh, and pinning down Stallings' men. At that point, Sillers uh, makes a very brave but foolhardy decision. He decides to reinforce Kellysville. So with his 500 men, he tries to double click across 700 yards of broken ground uh, with a couple of very stout fences uh, crossing his path and all of it under the might of Union artillery fire. And although he manages to get there, his regiment is so demoralized uh, by the experience uh, that Stallings orders Sellers to, to take his men back uh, where they started from. Uh, and uh, most of them do go back, but about 180 of them refuse to run to Scotland uh, again. And they, they hide here in Kellysville, seeking shelter uh, from the federal artillery fire. Uh, 
Uh, the Confederate artillery comes out uh, and tries to aid the defense, but with all these federal guns uh, taking it under counter battery fire, uh, the rebel gunners are forced to retire. And at this point, you're just waiting for the Yankee infantry assault, uh, which is made by the first U.S. sharpshooters. Uh, Colonel Regis, uh, not, not Regis, uh, Casper Tripp uh, sends four companies downstream to launch an attack into the Confederate flank. And once these guys are over the river, they turn to strike the main rebel defenses. And that allows Tripp's main body uh, to cross uh, the river. Uh, and although there's some, there's some nasty hand-to-hand -hand combat here, uh, the Federals take Kelly's Ford uh, relatively easily. And then they turn toward Kellysville uh, and uh, the Confederates defending it have no reason to stay there. So they uh, withdraw and French has his his uh, leading elements over the Rappahannock at the cost of seven dead and, and 35 wounded. Uh, Confederate casualties were significantly worse, uh, and this is unfortunate, but nonetheless, this was not unexpected. The, the Federals were gonna get across the river at Kelly's Ford if that's what they wanted uh, to do, and French orders a couple pontoon bridges put down. Uh, by nightfall, he's gonna have two divisions over the river and a third crossing the second corps ready to cross in the morning. The question is, are enough federal troops gonna be able to get over the river at Kellysville before Lee can launch the counterattack that Meade knows his opponent wants to launch? And that means that everything now depends on what's going on at Rappahannock Station, uh, where you have this Confederate bridgehead. Now this whole sector is under Ewell's command and he's arranged things so that Jubal Early's division which is camped around Brandy Station, and Edward Johnson's division, which is camped uh, between Brandy Station and Rhodes' uh, position closer to Kellysville, they rotate responsibility for these fortifications. They, they, they'll have a brigade in them for a week and then they switch. So uh, on the day before Meade launches his assault, the Stonewall Brigade of Johnson's division had marched out of these fortifications and the Louisiana Tigers under Harry Hayes ha had marched in. Uh, so this is why Rappahannock Station matters. Now, there had been a 500 foot long bridge there off and on throughout the war. Both sides had burned it on occasion. Both sides had rebuilt it on occasion. The Federals had burned it when they retreated in October and it has not been rebuilt, but you can see there's high ground here, and this is where the Confederate fortifications are going to be. There's also some high ground on this side where we will have more uh, Confederate uh, fortifications. And to give you an idea of what this sector looks like, this is the uh, line of the orange in Alexandria here before it was destroyed. This is Rappahannock Station. These buildings have all been burned by October of 1863. Uh, where you see the horizon, that is the river right there. So east of the railroad, the ground is flat. It's 350 yards of open terrain until you get to a 100 foot tall ridge that protrudes toward uh, the, the, the uh, Rappahannock. This view is from the south looking north. So there's a mill here that's been burned, but the stone walls are there, that bridge is gone. But there's, here's the high ground that marks part of the Confederate defenses. And this is the, the ground that we've been looking at on the other side of the river. Now, remember, this is the federal plan. So you've got Sedgwick bringing down the 6th and the 5th Corps. And they begin to deploy about a half mile, three quarters of a mile in front of Rappahannock Station. And as they deploy, the only thing that's standing in front of them is a brigade of Louisiana Tigers. Now this is Hayes' brigade, but he's on court-martial duty. So they're, they're, right now they're under the command of the very capable Colonel Davison Penn. There are five regiments, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th Louisiana. Uh, their strengths there you can see, it's 900 men uh, supported by a four-gun battery of artillery and their earthworks. Sedgwick has 26,000 men. If he had, as me told him to do, uh, moved aggressively against the Confederate works and attacked them as quickly as he could, uh, even with a single division from either the 5th or the 6th Corps, he could have swatted the Louisiana Tigers out of his way 
forced them to retreat across the pontoon bridge that Lee has laid uh, 300 yards uh, upstream from the burnt railroad bridge as the sole means of communication uh, between the south and the north bank uh, of the uh, Rappahannock uh, River. Uh, but Sedgwick does not know that he's only got 900 Confederates in, in front of him. Uh, Penn, as soon as he saw the Federals showing up, sent a warning to Early. Took an hour and a half or so for that message to get there, but Early had responded very quickly, ordered his division to begin to move to the river. Uh, Lee had gotten wind of what was going on. He himself rode toward Rappahannock Station because he realized that, that was the truly critical uh, point. Sedgwick spends two hours deploying his entire wing, his entire 26,000 man force, because Meade has warned him uh, that there are Confederate fortifications for Rappahannock Station. They're very strong fortifications. The Confederates are apt to launch a counterattack out of them. Meade admits that he's not certain these fortifications are susceptible to assault. So he basically plants caution in Sedgwick's mind. And Sedgwick is naturally cautious in the face of fortifications that we'd seen at Fredericksburg during the Chancellorsville uh, campaign. And so Sedgwick thinks it's best not to do anything until his entire force is deployed. Now, this is going to have two important consequences. The first and most immediate is it gives the Confederates who are caught by surprise and off balance two hours to recover. But it's also going to have an enormous psychological impact on the Louisiana Tigers who recognize that they are on the wrong side of a river, uh, on the, uh, that there's only a single bridge connecting them to the south side, uh, that if even a fraction of this federal force uh, moves forward uh, to, uh, to attack them, uh, they're going to be overwhelmed. And so the only thing uh, that would make sense at that point would to, to be to get across the river. Of course, they can't do that uh, without orders. This psychological uh, impact is going to be very important as the battle uh, is going to uh, play itself out. Uh, so you have Sykes with the Fifth Corps, uh, facing the rebels on the east side of the ONA. You have General Horatio Wright uh, in temporary command of the Sixth Corps on the west side uh, of the railroad. Uh, and here are your initial dispositions. So as the Federals deploy on either side of the ONA, again, about uh, half to three quarters of a mile from the river, uh, Penn pulls the Sixth Louisiana the 7th and the 8th Louisiana, which had been stationed uh, on some ridges about a quarter of a mile in front of the earthworks. This is, they, so everybody wasn't in here. Uh, there was only the 9th Louisiana and the artillery and the earthworks. Everybody else was stationed well forward uh, as observers, as, they, as an out guard. Well, obviously, they fulfilled their function. Uh, they know there are a lot of Yankees here, so the regiments are pulled in with only a skirmish line left behind. Uh, as part of the warning uh, that Penn has issued, two batteries of artillery under uh, Graham and Dance, the, the Rock Ridge and the Powhatan artillery, uh, come racing forward to take position in some previously dug earthworks on some high ground uh, south of the river. The 5th Louisiana, which had been uh, guarding the south bank, is brought over into the fortifications. And so Penn concentrates his forces there and some additional artillery comes up, as do Robert E. Lee and Jubal Early, who are going to watch most of what's gonna happen from this high ground here, and they're waiting for the rest of Early's infantry uh, to come forward. So Sedgwick, abundance of caution, spends two hours deploying his troops. And then when he is ready to move, he again moves cautiously. So he is going to send a line of skirmishers forward across his entire front, uh, but he's only gonna send a single division forward in support of those skirmishers on either side of the railroad. So Brigadier General Albion Howe is, is going to bring his division forward uh, behind the six core skirmishers and his job is to seize the ridge overlooking Rappahannock Station's fortifications. Uh, so that the Federals can put artillery there. On the east side of the railroad, uh, Brigadier General 
uh, Joseph Bartlett is going to move forward with his units in a densely packed column of divisions that you see here uh, in support of the skirmishers. And what Cedric wants to do is he wants to seal off the Confederate fortifications. He wants to put a solid ring of skirmishers around them. He wants to get control of Beverly Ford, which is just upstream to the west. He wants to seize the high ground so he can put artillery on it and then try and shell the Confederates out of their fortifications. Uh, none, none of the federal generals is interested in launching an attack on these Confederate entrenchments. That, that seems a ill-advised act of suicide. And so if artillery can do the job, uh, Sedgwick is inclined uh, to let it uh, at least try uh, to do uh, the job. And so the Federals finally move forward at 3 p.m. Now, at, at this juncture, the, the battle over at Kellysville has, is, is reaching its climax, uh, but Sedgwick is just starting to move. The Confederate skirmishers make a fighting retreat back into their fortifications. The Federal skirmishers move forward without difficulty, the two divisions doing the same. Confederate artillery gives them a little bit of grief uh, but the Yankees basically achieve what they want to achieve without undue difficulty. Uh, Early has ridden back from the bridgehead and he's come over to Lee and he's aware that Penn does not have enough men to form a solid line inside the fortifications. So he's got uh, the 8th and 9th Louisiana uh, uh, and the Louisiana Guard Artillery over here on his right flank. He's got the 5th and 7th Louisiana over here on his left flank, uh, and in between them is basically nothing more than a strong skirmish line. So if the Federals had kept going, they would have forced the Confederates to abandon the bridgehead, and with the abandonment of the bridgehead, uh, Lee's entire defensive strategy collapses because then either Sedgwick can fight his way over the river uh, and uh, be able to, with, uh, with French put the Confederates in a pincer, or, or the Federals could shift all of their troops down to Kelly's Ford uh, and, and make that part of the army too strong for Lee uh, to counterattack. But once again, Sedgwick's caution. Uh, so he stops when he could have kept going, uh, and that allows the Confederates, again, another period of grace. Now, what are the Yankees looking at? This is a sketch made by Edwin Forbes in 1862 when there was a battle at Rappahannock Station uh, as the part of the second Manassas campaign. So we're looking at Rappahannock Station from the ridge that Howe's division has just occupied. So just a few salient features here. This is the ridge on which the Confederate fortifications are located. These houses are long gone, but there's a Confederate fort here and a Confederate fort over here. These are the hills south of the river where Lee and Early are watching uh, events unfold and where the Confederate artillery under Grant and Dance have deployed. Uh, this little town, uh, which was known as Bowenville, uh, right next to Rappahannock Station, that's all burned, but this is where the, the railroad would be. And there's the river right there. Where you see this little fence line here, that's the Freeman's Ford Road that runs in front of the Confederate fortifications connecting ultimately Kellysville to Freeman's Ford. And right along here, this is sort of a sunken road. And, and that's, that's going to matter to us a great deal uh, in a moment. Now, the Confederate fortifications. This is, this is one part of the Battle of Rappahannock Station story uh, that has always elicited a great deal of confusion. Uh, uh, there are no maps in the official record, uh, either of Union and Confederate origin, uh, about the Confederate fortifications or the battle itself. It's somewhat unusual, but no maps of this fight were ever drawn uh, by either army in official capacity. Uh, as part of my research, however, I found out that there were some maps that were drawn uh, of this engagement by men who were there. Uh, and this is one of them. It was drawn by uh, a federal uh, soldier uh, who uh, was a surgeon uh, with the, the 50th uh, New York engineers. He had a habit of drawing maps. And so this gives us one look at the Confederate fortifications. So here is the line of the railroad. 
Now the railroad, remember, up to the river is destroyed and it sits on top of a 10 foot tall embankment to carry it over low ground. This is the ridge that we were looking at in that picture. These are the hills on which the Confederates have their artillery south. And you'll see that the Confederate fortifications, a small fort here, a larger fort here. Now the placement of the bridge is wrong in this map, but you can see that the strength of the Confederate position is on the right flank or the Western flank. And then the Confederate line curves back uh, to meet a bend in the river. Uh, so that it's a little bit of a semicircular shape. Now, east of the railroad, there are additional Confederate fortifications, and these are almost always left out on maps of the battle. Uh, this is about a 140-yard long line of earthworks that bend back toward the river, following the course of a little stream called Tin Pot Run that flows across the northern face of the ridge that the Federals have just occupied and where they're about to put up uh, their artillery. Now, that's one map of the battlefield that shows you the Confederate fortifications. This one uh, is a little bit more detailed and it, it, it helps us see some very important features of the Confederate fortifications. So on the right flank, uh, on a tall hill overlooking the railroad embankment, uh, is a small enclosed Confederate fort uh, that's got two artillery pieces. Then you've got about 360 yards of trench between them. And this is a very elaborate trench. It's dug in a it was what's called a stepped pattern. If you're familiar with World War I trenches, this will look very, uh, very familiar to you. Uh, so you've got the parapet out here, but you, this is dug in such a way uh, that if the enemy gets into the trench, he can't shoot down its length. Uh, and uh, th these traverses here protect the troops from enfilade fire. So that's the kind of trench that is between these two forts. Then you've got a large redoubt that's got two guns. And right next to that is a road that comes up from the pontoon bridge and heads north. Now, this is a part of the fortification that has never been uncovered before. But this is exceptionally important because obviously the whole point of this bridgehead was to allow the Confederates to launch an attack out of it. To do that, they must move beyond the entrenchments, which means they need a road. And so where this road pierces the entrenchments, you can't have a solid line of earthworks. And so the Confederates had built two outworks and these are kind of staggered here. If you've ever had to drive onto a military installation and zigzag through the, the barricades, you know exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, the idea is the troops in the back entrenchments can fire through the gap in the front entrenchments and any traffic coming through has to zigzag through. But these gaps here make this the weakest part of the defense. From there, the Confederate line stretches back toward a curve uh, in the river uh, for about a half a mile, but notice that it is not a, simply a semicircular line. No, no military man in his right mind would ever dig a semicircular line of earthworks. So these are zigzag trenches. Uh, the, one federal said sort of gave the Confederate uh, line a serrated look. Now, <clears throat> not too far behind them, the ground slopes very steeply back toward the river. And because of a dam built downstream, this part of the Rappahannock is too wide and too deep for 40, uh, which is going to be very important when we get a little bit later on. Uh, here is the sunken portion of the Freeman's Ford Road. This is where the Federals are going to put their artillery. And so the, these Confederate fortifications from a federal perspective look incredibly daunting. No wonder Sykes and Wright and Sedgwick do not want to launch a frontal attack against them. Now, General Early would tell you that these fortifications have some weaknesses. There are no ditches in front of the Confederate fortifications. The parapets of all these fortifications are very low and gently sloping so that they don't offer any real obstruction to someone who's determined to climb them. There's no abatis in front to break up an enemy's line of battle. And on this left flank of the Confederate works, uh, there, uh, the, some of the trenches have been dug too far back uh, 
so it's great for protection, but it doesn't allow you to fire on the enemy until he is very, very uh, close to you. Uh, and right at the moment, of course, we know uh, that uh, for uh, the Federals, uh, they are facing a broken line of defense. Remember, the middle of the Confederate line is held by nothing but skirmishers. That is, until uh, Early's division arrives on the scene, and he sends Gordon's brigade off uh, to watch Norman's Ford, uh, and he sends uh, the uh, hoax brigade of North Carolinians into the bridgehead to reinforce Hayes. Now, Hoke and one of his regiments have gone back to North Carolina uh, in order to round up deserters. So Archibald Godwin, a Virginian, is in command today. He's got three regiments, and this is, this is a pretty big brigade. Uh, and one of the, the biggest of these regiments, the 54th North Carolina, uh, was not at Gettysburg. Uh, and so it didn't participate in the night attack on Cemetery Hill that both Hayes Louisianans uh, and the rest of Hoke's Brigade had, had taken part in. And that, too, is going to play a role uh, in what's about to happen here. So uh, Godwin takes his men across the bridge. He fills in the middle of Hayes' line. This surprises Lee a little bit because Lee wasn't sure if he wanted to reinforce the North Bank. Lee is looking toward a fight at Kelly's Ford the next morning when he can launch his counterattack. Uh, he doesn't want to risk too many troops north of the Rappahannock. Uh, the, the, that position was always designed to force me to divide his army, right? Uh, and he's done that. Me just divided his army. But Lee wants to keep it divided as long as he possibly can, which means he's got to keep that bridgehead looking threatening. Uh, if he pulls his troops out of it, then the threat of the bridgehead disappears. Me can shift his whole army to Kelly's Ford. Lee's chance of a counterattack is gone. So he's playing a bluff here. Uh, and, and he's, he's, he's playing it uh, with great daring. He's going to try and keep Sedgwick locked in place until nightfall. Uh, at that point, he can shift most of his army into position to attack French uh, at, uh, at dawn. Uh, and so uh, you have now the final Confederate dispositions in the bridgehead, the 7th and 5th Louisiana on the left flank, the 54th, 6th, and 57th North Carolina in the center, the 8th Louisiana holding the large redoubt and this broken place in the trenches, and then the 9th Louisiana, the space between the small fort and the big fort, and then the poor 6th Louisiana, uh, which doesn't even have 200 men, is isolated all by itself over here. This one little regiment facing an entire federal corps that's out there and uh, unable to get support uh, from the rest of the position because of this very tall railroad embankment. So altogether, uh, you've got about 2,000 Confederates, four artillery pieces inside this position. Now, Lee understands that these fortifications are slight, uh, but he believes that they, they're doing what's necessary and that the Federals can only attack him on an equal front and so they can only bring equal numbers against him. Uh, and at that point, his fortifications ought to, to be able uh, to hold, especially since the troops he has in them and the officer he has in them uh, are very, very good. Uh, Hayes has come back from court martial duty, so he's on the scene now. Uh, and things for the Confederates are, are looking fairly decent. So the Federals bring up the artillery about 345. They begin a bombardment of the Confederate line. You can see their skirmishers have sealed off the entire bridgehead. And this bombardment goes on until almost five o'clock. And the Confederate artillery responds, very dramatic, but not much damage done on either side. About five o'clock, the Federals bring up more artillery over here from Sykes, and they add their guns to the bombardment, but still, it's not producing the desired effect. And for Meade, this is all very problematic. Uh, he's taken uh, a command post in between uh, Rappahannock Station and Kelly's Ford, but he hasn't heard from Sedgwick. Uh, he just hears this distant artillery fire. Uh, he is very worried about the counterattack he expects against French the next morning. Uh, and if he can't unite his army 
by getting across the river at Rappahannock Station as well as Kelly's Ford, he is, after nightfall, going to have to pull most of Sedgwick's troops away and march them rapidly to Kelly's Ford in hope of reinforcing French uh, before Lee launches that dreaded counterattack. Uh, so the Federals here uh, really are under a lot of pressure, uh, but Sedgwick still seems disinclined to launch a frontal attack right doesn't want to launch a frontal attack, but Albion Hall and David Russell, whose troops are in front of the Confederate fortifications, these two men sense how weak the rebel position is. These are the, the two generals whose troops had taken Marie's Heights at Fredericksburg during the Chancellorsville campaign. They're not necessarily afraid of earthworks. And how, when he had taken the ridge from which Union artillery is now pummeling the Confederate fortifications, had begged Wright for the chance to attack earlier in the day, and he had been turned down. We're going to let the guns do it. But by 5 o'clock, it's obvious the guns aren't doing it. And at this juncture, Brigadier General David Russell, who's commanding Wright's 1st Division while Wright has the Corps, uh, decides uh, that these Confederate fortifications can be taken. And he sends word to Wright asking for permission to launch an assault. And he has a very clever uh, plan that he is going to employ. He's got half of the 6th Maine, which is from his own 3rd Brigade, in the sunken portion of the Freeman's Ford Road. What he wants to do right before dusk, which is coming very quickly, is to send the second half of the six main forward as skirmishers into the sunken road. The Confederates, he knows, will see this, but they'll expect that this is just one group of skirmishers relieving another group of skirmishers before dark. Instead, when these guys get into the sunken road, they're going to fix bayonets and launch an immediate attack on the large Confederate or down. Quickly coming behind them in column of divisions is going to be the 5th Wisconsin, the 119th and 49th Pennsylvania, sort of like battering rams. And they're going to come in, and uh, about five minutes after the six main attacks, these guys are going to slam into the large redoubt. This massive force will overwhelm the rebel defenders. They'll take the redoubt, seize the bridge, and basically cut off the rest of its Confederate defenders, who can therefore uh, be destroyed. Very daring plan, uh, but Wright decides to let Russell launch it. It's almost dark. It's going to be completely dark in about 30 minutes. The dusk ought to obscure uh, what the Federals are doing, how small the actual attacking force is, and it should surprise the rebels. Uh, and so this is Russell's plan, and it gets approved. Now, note that the Confederates in this fortification had launched a dusk attack on Cemetery Hill on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg that had taken that key position. And if they had been reinforced, uh, it might have won the battle. So these guys are well aware of the possibilities of a night attack. They're not going to be surprised very easily. Uh, but this is, this is Russell's scheme. And if he had tried to launch this in daylight, and the Confederates could have seen the small size of the force coming against him, this would have never worked. But a dusk attack, which is going to shield the strength of the attacking force, uh, stands a pretty good chance. So Colonel Harris, Benjamin Harris of 6th Maine, uh, Colonel Allen's 5th Wisconsin, those are your primary attacking forces. Uh, and the Federals, it turns out, are going to throw a lot more force into this than Russell had planned. Because when the 6th Maine launches this attack, the skirmishers on its flank, the 121st New York, about 50 men under Captain John Fish, are going to assume to attack that they hadn't received, and they're going to join the battle. So is part of the 20th Maine skirmishers uh, to the left of the 6th Maine. And when those skirmishers go forward, that's going to trigger an advance by the skirmishers east of the railroad against the 6th Louisiana. So this is going to add... Uh, a lot more strength to Russell's attack. And it turns out that these skirmishers, spontaneous advance is going to be key to the success of the federal operation. So here's kind of uh, what it looked like at the time. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got the skirmishers of the Fifth Corps 
moving forward east of the railroad embankment. You can see here's the small Confederate fort. There are the rebel forts on the other side of the river. This is the burned railroad bridge. And this is that Confederate fortification controlled by the 6th Louisiana. And when the 6th Louisiana sees these federal skirmishers coming at them, they assume that this is an advance by the entire Federal Fifth Corps. Remember, it's very dark. They can't really see what's going on. They know that they're isolated. There's no way that they can hold out here. And so their colonel orders them to move by their left flank and then to retreat down the railroad bankment and to ford the river uh, at the Burnt Railroad Bridge. And about half of the Confederates get away. The other half are, are captured or shot down by the Federals as they uh, attempt to flee across the river. But this part of the Confederate line collapses almost immediately. West of the railroad, it's a lot dicier. The 6th Maine gets to the Confederate fortifications, but it takes two or three very deadly volleys uh, from, uh, from the rebels uh, and basically is stalled in front of those fortifications. Now, luckily for the Yankees, the 121st New York skirmishers hit this weak point in the Confederate line. And remember I talked about the psychological effect of Sedgwick deploying two whole corps? Well, the Confederates in here, which can't really see what's coming at them, are well aware that there's over 25,000 Yankees in front of them. And because the Federals are coming in in this sort of wave formation, the rebel defenders imagine that wave after wave of federal troops are about to descend upon them, that they're, they're being attacked by entire divisions, that there's no way they can hold out. And so when these 50 federal skirmishers from the 121st New York hit this sector of the line, uh, it collapses almost immediately. 120 Confederates just surrender right there. And this allows the federals to pierce the center of the Confederate line. The 6th Maine, <clears throat> excuse me, is in a really tough hand-to-hand -hand fight for this large redoubt. But the 5th Wisconsin, although it's about five minutes late compared to what it was supposed to be, <clears throat> manages to come up and reinforce this fight in the nick of time. <clears throat> and that allows the, uh, the large redoubt to fall, the trench between the two forts to be taken, and the Confederates are forced to abandon the small fort. So within about 15, 20 minutes of the beginning of the attack, this entire side of the Confederate line has basically uh, collapsed. And when the 119th and 49th come up here uh, and reinforce uh, the initial attack, there's no way that the Confederates are going to, to retake this half of their line. Now, the 8th and 9th Louisiana are kind of falling back toward the bridge. They're a disorganized mob. The Federals are firing on them. But there are a lot of Confederates on this side of the line that could counterattack and redeem the situation. Uh, Hoke has pulled the 6th, uh, I'm sorry, Godwin has pulled the 6th and 57th North Carolina back to refuse the flank. And if these rebels uh, become aggressive, then the Federals are going to lose whatever they have gained. So at that point, uh, Russell sends word for Colonel Emory Upton to bring two regiments forward to reinforce the battle. And, and Upton rushes his men forward in a column of division. But by the time he gets close to the battlefield, uh, these forts have already been taken and Russell's feeling pretty good about his ability to hold this part of the line. What he can't deal with, with the force that's here, is the enfilade fire coming from this Confederate salient. So he tells <coughs> Upton to, uh, to ignore reinforcing the fight for the redoubt, to swing his men around, throw them into line, and to attack this Confederate salient. <clears throat> and uh, this, of course, is a part of the battle that is very often completely misunderstood. Most maps of the battle show Upton making this wild swing to attack the Confederates frontally. That is not what he does. And so he very adroitly remaneuvers his men, he hits a part of the line that's very weak where the 54th Carolina sort of spread itself out to try and make up for some of the trenches that have been abandoned by the 6th and 57th when the flank was refused. And remember, the 54th is the only regiment on the Confederate side that wasn't at Gettysburg. It was the only regiment that had never been in a night action. 
And so the Federals take this saline very quickly and without much resistance. And Upton decides that he's going to, uh, to take advantage of confusion in the Confederate lines. So this is uh, a drawing made by Alfred Road of the battle in the aftermath, but it shows some important things here. There's the small fort back there. There's the large redoubt. You can see the zigzag nature of the Confederate line. There's the pontoon bridge and see how steep that slope is going down to the unfordable Rappahannock uh, River. So Upton, having gotten this part of the Confederate line, does something pretty ingenious. He leaves one battalion of the uh, Fifth Maine to hold what he's taken. He sends one wing of the 121st New York to seize the bridge. Then he pulls the other two wings of the Fifth Maine and 121st New York out of the works, goes back in front of them, reorganizes them into a line of battle, orders them to right face, which puts them in a column, and then he races in front of the Confederate line in the darkness, these trenches here are dug too far back to enable the Confederates to really fire effectively at the Federals. And as soon as he gets in front of Confederate defenders again, he halts his men, fronts them toward the enemy, makes this very loud speech in which he tells his men, when the enemy opens fire, I want my first line to lay down because I got four lines of battle behind me and we're gonna swamp the rebels which of course is exactly what the Confederates are imagining is about to happen to them. And then he launches his attack and the 54th North Carolina collapses almost immediately. Uh, and so the Federals have gotten into the works here. And at this point, Colonel Edwards in command of the 5th Maine takes about 12 men and runs off to his right in pursuit of some Confederates who are running away. And he thinks he's going to just gather up a bunch of stragglers. What he finds very quickly, however, is that he comes upon the rear of the 5th Louisiana. He, he has in the dark blundered into the entire Confederate left flank and standing with 12 men behind an entire Confederate regiment, he knows he's in a really bad spot. And if the Confederates realize what's going on, he's not going to get out of that bad spot in, in one place or in one piece. And so he does something incredibly bold. He bluffs and he demands who's in command of this part of the, of the lie. And Captain John Angel, who's got charge of the 5th Louisiana, which is all 125 men strong, uh, hears that and he turns around and he says, well, I am, sir, and who are you? And Edward says, I'm commander of the 5th Maine and I demand your immediate surrender. Well, the 5th and the 7th Louisiana had no idea what's been going on over here. They've been sniping with Federals in their front. They've heard a bunch of noise, but the, there's a really stiff south wind blowing that's carrying all the noise away uh, from the south bank of the river. And so uh, they're, they're completely discombobulated. There's, there's suddenly Federals behind them. Uh, and Angel says, uh, well, give me time to consult my officers. And Edwards, recognizing that he can't afford to abandon his bluff, says, I'm not gonna give you one minute. Uh, and he waves his hand back over your shoulders and he says, your entire uh, right flank has been captured uh, and you see all of my men pouring into your works. They're going to attack you any second if you don't give up. Well, the Confederates can see a lot of guys moving back here behind them, but it's actually prisoners being hustled uh, out of the lines. But in the darkness, it's just a moving mob of men and so Angel believes that these are all federal reinforcements. So remember, psychologically, the Confederates have been dreading an entire federal corps coming down on them all afternoon. And so in the darkness, it's very easy to believe that that's in fact what is happening. And so Angel agrees to surrender his entire regiment to Colonel Edwards and 12 men. And when the 5th Louisiana has to lay down its arms, the 7th Louisiana has no choice. It has to lay down its arms as well. Uh, Edwards found himself holding about a dozen Confederate swords where officers had come up and, and turned him over uh, to him. And at this point now, uh, the Confederate position has collapsed uh, completely. Some of the 8th and 9th Louisiana have fled across the bridge. Most of the mounted Confederate officers managed to get away. Uh, Godwin, 
could have cut his way out with the 6th and 57th North Carolina, uh, but he has no orders to do that, and so he stubbornly refuses uh, to try and escape the trap, and he keeps fighting until the Federals come down on him uh, and, and force his surrender. So in the span of about 40 minutes, the entire Confederate bridgehead has collapsed. And with the loss of the bridgehead, Lee's entire defensive strategy has collapsed as well, because now he earns the risk of either most of Sedgwick's wing going over here to reinforce French at Kelly's Ford, or Sedgwick fighting his way easily across the river the next morning to allow the two halves of the federal army to link up. And Lee is therefore going to have to fight a battle inside the Culpeper V, uh, which is not a good idea. Uh, recognizing that uh, he's lost his edge, Lee has no choice but to withdraw. The problem is he's got all these supplies inside the Culpeper V. So he orders his quartermasters to pack everything up and head toward the Rapidan as fast as they can. Now, they're only going to get about five or six hours to pack up. They do a remarkable job of, of, of loading most of what the Army needs, but it's going to take them an entire day to get all the way across the Rapidan. So Lee is going to have to make a stand. So after the wagons leave at midnight, he pulls his army back and assumes a defensive position uh, in front of Culpeper Courthouse. It's a very vulnerable defensive position. His left flank is completely in the air. His right flank is just a couple of miles from the river. If the Federals get between him and the Rapidan, they could cut his entire army off. But Lee has no choice except to make a stand. He puts his cavalry out front on the main axis of federal advance to slow them down, and then he waits for Meade to show up and launch an attack that he is not certain that he can beat off. Fortunately for Lee, Meade is almost as surprised by his victory at Rappahannock Station as the rebels were. Uh, he had always figured that at best he could fight his way over the river and then he would have a big battle with the Confederates at Brandy Station. Uh, he is concentrating on uniting his command first and foremost. That's gonna take him most of the morning. And it's not until around noon that he begins a push down the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. And even then he does it with a very small force of a couple of regiments that push the Confederates back uh, beyond uh, the Confederate cavalry, back beyond Brandy Station, uh, but most of the Federal Army doesn't move more than four or five miles that morning. So uh, Meade doesn't understand how advantageous a position he is in now, that he has completely uh, disrupted Lee's plan of defense, uh, that if the Federals were to move fast and keep pushing until they found the rebels, they could start a battle that even if they couldn't break their Confederate line, they would entangle Lee in a fight uh, from which he could not easily uh, withdraw. But Meade is very careful, very timid. At three in the afternoon, he gets his army to Brandy Station. And with two hours of daylight left, and only a couple miles between him and the rebels, he halts his army. He stops. He doesn't keep pushing and therefore he throws away the opportunity that he had won at Rappahannock Station. If he had kept going, he could have forced the battle that Lee didn't think he could win. He could have held the Confederates in place long enough to get the rest of his army up here and maybe on November 9th have a showdown fight with an army of Northern Virginia that had never occupied weaker ground. But Meade is content with what he's done. He's not gonna run any undue chances. And so he stops, wastes a couple hours of daylight, and puts his men into camp. And on the night of November 8th, a grateful Lee, who has stood his ground all day long expecting an attack, Lee puts his army on the road to the Rapidan uh, and manages to cross it safely without any federal pursuit whatsoever. And so uh, by the middle of November, uh, the Confederates are once again behind the Rapidan. Uh, Meade is not going to advance any further. He's not gonna stick his neck out and go deeper into Culpeper V. He's gonna stay here 
rebuild the last nine miles of the railroad to get to the bridge, which he will also rebuild. And only when his railroad supply line is secure all the way to Brandy Station uh, will he finally uh, decide to move forward. That obviously is going to take a couple of weeks. Uh, and when Meade does move forward again, uh, it will lead to his mine run uh, offensive, which will actually be the, the, uh, the subject uh, of the last book in my Meade and Lee uh, series. And so uh, <clears throat> the Federals, from a tactical standpoint, had done pretty well. They destroyed two Confederate brigades and a battery of artillery. It was uh, heralded in the North, this daring night attack against Confederate fortifications that had been uh, overrun. And Meade got lots of plaudits for his daring uh, generalship, all of which ignored the fact uh, that if Sedgwick had been bolder uh, during the, the day of November 7th, if Meade had been bolder on the morning of November 8th, the Federals could have achieved a great deal more uh, than they did. As it was, uh, this remarkable tactical triumph merely shoved Lee back behind uh, the Rapidan River and made another uh, campaign uh, necessary uh, a few weeks uh, later. And so that uh, is uh, the, the story of the Rappahannock Station campaign. Well, thank you uh, so much for that very, very detailed presentation. And I think we do have a, a few questions. Let's see. Um, so if you can, um, Maybe stop sharing with your screen. I think I can get to the, let's see. There, there we, we go. go. Perfect. And I will uh, bring myself up here and we'll see what kind of questions we've got. I think we've got a, a few questions in here. Uh, the first one says, it's been popularly believed that Meade pursued Meade pursued weakly after Gettysburg and thus lost the opportunity to, to destroy Lee's army. Given that he continued to engage Lee in this series of battles following Gettysburg, would you take the view that this claim is false? So certainly uh, Meade is, he's, he's a very deliberate general. He's very competent general, but he's very deliberate. Uh, Lee's escape across the Potomac surprised him. He didn't think that the Confederates could get across the flooded river and they would have an extra day in which to launch his assault. Uh, once they're across the river, uh, Meade is very careful. He knows that his army's been shot to pieces at Gettysburg. Uh, a lot of his, his commanders are replacements and with whom he does not have uh, a lot of confidence. And remember, he's only been in command of the army uh, for a couple of weeks at that point. Uh, juncture. He gets some bad intelligence that, that sort of steers him wrong uh, and allows Lee to get across uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, but when both armies wind up at the Rapp Upper Rappahannock in early August, at the beginning of August of, of 1863, Meade intends to keep pushing Lee. Uh, he, he wants to see how far a Gettysburg battered Army of Northern Virginia will back up before it stands and fights. Uh, and he was fully prepared uh, to cross the Rappahannock uh, and see what he could accomplish when Lincoln sent him to word to stop uh, and to send troops to reinforce, uh, to, to enforce conscription in, in the North. It's very possible that in August of 63, Meade would have been able to push Lee away from the Upper Rappahannock and the Rapidan uh, because the Army of Northern Virginia just wasn't in a position uh, to stand uh, and fight. And so uh, I, I think that Meade, to an extent, gets kind of a bum rap. Um, uh, and this is really more uh, the story of my second book than, than this one. But uh, there's this, this really intense strategic debate uh, between Meade and Halleck and, and Lincoln uh, and, and Meade is very frustrated that he's not being given the kind of strategic flexibility that his predecessors had, had that he's being tied to the Orange in Alexandria uh, and, and forced to operate along uh, a disadvantageous 
uh, axis of advance that really leads nowhere. The Confederates must defend and forces them to spend all these troops to defend the railroad. Uh, and uh, so, so Meade is never really the master uh, of, his, of his own strategy. Uh, he, he's, he's expected to accomplish something, but he, uh, so he's given the responsibility, but in many ways he's not given the authority. Uh, and although this period that I write about is the only part of the war where we get to see George Meade uh, in sole command of the Army of the without Grant there looking over his shoulder, um, you might argue that it's not a, a, a fair test uh, of Meade's ability. Uh, what I've come to conclude is that, that um, Meade is a good general, he's a competent general, he is, he is able to envision grand strategic movements, uh, but when the moment for a fight comes, there's just a little bit of a hesitation uh, in Meade. He has a sort of deliberate one step at a time uh, operational tempo, uh, which it doesn't work very well against Robert E. Lee. Uh, that said, uh, you know, uh, if, if Meade can't bring Lee to battle, he doesn't let Lee bring him to battle either. Uh, and as far as the troops of the Army of the Potomac are concerned, they were a little tepid with Meade. Uh, a lot of them were, were not happy with him once Lee got across the Potomac. Uh, but his ability to keep Lee from trapping the Army of the Potomac during the Bristow campaign impressed them. You know, he, he's done better than Pope. Uh, you so, uh, when Lee tried the same game, uh, then they're impressed by his victory at Rappahannock Station, even though some of them say, well, we could have made more out of it. Uh, when you get to Mine Run, his refusal to hurl his men against those Confederate fortifications and what many of them believe would be a worse than Fredericksburg slaughter, uh, lead the army to believe that, hey, this guy's better than Burnside. Uh, so uh, he's sort of McClellan-esque uh, in a way without the political downside of McClellan. Um, so I, it's, it's kind of hard to judge Meade. He's not a bad general. Uh, he is willing to be aggressive, but he doesn't want to fight unless he can throw his whole strength in and fight a decisive battle that will make the casualties he's going to suffer mean something than just another big bloodbath in which one army retreats a few miles and, and you, you lick your wounds until it's time uh, to fight again. All right. So um, you talk quite a bit about kind of Meade. Thinking about Lee, uh, kind of what was his mindset? Was he still hoping to be able to fight a, a battle of annihilation? Yes. And, and I, you see this in, in Lee, uh, you know, uh, by the middle of August, he's talking to Jefferson Davis about wanting to resume the offensive. In early September, he gets permission to resume the offensive. And that's only foiled uh, by Longstreet having to go west. And uh, when Meade pushes into Culpeper County in mid-September, he, he, Lee writes Jeff Davis and says, you know, we've sent Longstreet someplace where he's gonna do no good uh, when he's needed here. Uh, and given the way that Chickamauga and Chattanooga play out for the Confederates in the long run, it's, it's hard to argue that Lee was wrong. Uh, when you consider that before Longstreet goes west, uh, there's only a 10,000 man difference in the strength of the Army of Northern Virginia and the Army of the Potomac. Uh, and what, what Lee might have done if Longstreet had been with Lee during the Bristow campaign, it, it's, it's very easy to believe that that campaign would have produced a, a big battle uh, that Lee would have had a pretty good chance to win. Uh, Lee understands that a long war is a dicey proposition for the Confederates. You're, you're fighting an enemy with superior resources and superior manpower. Uh, if it becomes a war of attrition, you're going to lose unless the enemy's will to continue the fight collapses. Uh, and although the Confederates, of course, are gonna come close to achieving that in the fall of 64, uh, you, we know how readily the Federals overturn that possibility, right? Uh, and so we, uh, is frustrated that all of his victories uh, allow the Federals to escape, to live, to fight another day. Uh, if he doesn't destroy the enemy army sooner or later, that enemy army is apt to grind him down. And that only some sort of dramatic, uh, you know, winning the war kind of victory in Virginia is apt to counterbalance how badly things are going for the Confederacy in the West. And I think Lee recognizes that 
you know, both options that he's got, you, you try and win a war of attrition or, or seek that, you know, that decisive triumph are, are long odds gambles, uh, but you've got to throw the dice in one direction or the other. Uh, and he thinks that seeking that battle of annihilation, as some people uh, like to call it, is, is the one that allows him to have the initiative uh, and, and, and use maneuvering to offset his, his weaker hand, if you will. Uh, and so it's, it's not an unreasonable uh, p position. Uh, it, it ultimately doesn't work, yeah. uh, but it's not an unreasonable strategy. All right, thank you. And uh, Pat says that this was the best explanation of the campaign and she appreciates the research to locate the drawings, handmade maps and old photographs. There is a lot of stuff that was out there about these, uh, the, this campaign and in fact the entire fall of 1863 and I'm very fortunate that I'm the one who got to mine it uh, and, and bring it uh, to the public. And then Niels asked, do you think that Upton's experience at Rappahannock Station set a precedent for his later assault at Spotsylvania during the Overland Campaign. So I have an entire appendix in the book about Emory Upton, uh, because of course uh, Upton uh, at the Battle of the Wilderness uh, is urging uh, that, you know, hey look, we, we don't attack enemy fortifications in, in long lines, we need a dense body of troops that will attack rapidly and and tear a gap and then send the reinforcements through to exploit it. And uh, the, the um, interesting thing is, is that at Spotsylvania, uh, after Sedgwick gets killed by a rebel sniper, uh, Wright is in command of the Sixth Corps, Russell is command of the First Division, Upton still has a brigade. And so all the players at Rappahannock Station find themselves together again in basically the same circumstances. Uh, and uh, Upton is given the opportunity to lead an assault that is very much in keeping with what Russell had done uh, at uh, Rappahannock Station. And it does breach the Confederate line, but of course there's no river, no pontoon bridge. Ewell's able to send the reinforcements forward and, and plug the gap. Uh, but that little temporary victory by Upton is what inspired Grant to launch the big assault on the mule shoe that becomes so famous. Uh, and after the war, Upton goes on to become one of the Army's most preeminent, you know, tactician and reformer, and so he becomes very famous. And looking backward, uh, when people are trying to understand Upton's thinking and, and how he got to the, you know, pinnacle that he gets to in the post-war Army, they go back to Spotsylvania, uh, and Spotsylvania always leads them back to Rappahannock Station. And the interesting thing is that it's not Upton who's responsible for the federal success at Rappahannock Station. It's, it's David Russell. But David Russell is killed in the Valley in 1864. Uh, Sedgwick is killed at Spotsylvania. So, and, and Wright, although he stays in the Army and he reaches great rank and stuff, kind of fades into the background. So the most famous survivor of these battles is Upton, and somehow it gets woven into the record that, oh, he's the mastermind of Rappahannock Station, uh, and he uses those same tactics at uh, the wilderness, or, or rather at Spotsylvania. Uh, and that, that's actually not true. He, he's not the innovator at Rappahannock Station. He sees what happens at Rappahannock Station, what Russell does, and then he tries with some success, temporarily at least, to use those same tactics uh, at, at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Thank you for that. And we'll end on one final question. Uh, this is, uh, since Meade failed to exploit his victory at Rappahannock Station, do you believe that it was the ba this battle, not Gettysburg, that re represented his true opportunity to destroy Lee's army? You know, I, that's a very good question, and I think that there is an argument to be made for that. I'm always a little, little cautious about, you know, uh, counterfactual history, uh, but if you want to talk about a place where the Army of the Potomac was in very good shape, it had suffered very little to get across the Rappahannock, uh, it knew the terrain, it was fresh, so unlike Gettysburg, where it had been shot to pieces, where two of its three of its corps had been wrecked, right? Uh, and it was down to immediately after the battle, only 45,000 men. Uh, it, it's, 
it is, I think, quite questionable whether the Army of the Potomac was in any condition to really finish Lee off. Uh, and even when you get to Williamsport, it's probably a 50-50 proposition, and we can never know for sure. Uh, Lee's army forced back against Culpeper Courthouse in November of 1863 is in an incredibly vulnerable position. Meade's got 88,000 men. Lee has 55,000 men. Uh, and his flanks are basically in the air. Um, could Meade have destroyed Lee's army? Probably not destroyed it. I think some part of it would have escaped, but he could have mauled it. He could have wrecked it. He could have left it to where the Overland campaign would have been completely uh, different. Uh, and so I do think it probably does in a way represent Meade's greatest missed opportunity as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Lots of food for thought there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. And, and, sure thing. and uh, one last thing, if, uh, if anybody is interested in, um, in uh, getting signed copies of uh, my book, um, I am happy to, um, well, I was going to say, I'd, I'd be happy to email you, uh, let you email me, but I don't have that slide. I thought I did. Uh, so my apologies uh, uh, for that. Uh, Do you want to drop it into the chat? Did you want to drop I, your email into the chat? Uh, I certainly uh, will do that. Uh, and you can always uh, uh, Google the Texas Military Forces Museum okay. and contact us button. Uh, and I see those emails. And I'm happy <laughs> to, to talk to you uh, about signing a book for you and, and sending it to you. Great. That's um, that's perfect. And uh, of course, Savas Beatty, the publisher also has it. And I think they're doing the code virtual at 20% off too. So, um, and so is absolutely, they, they've got them and, uh, and you can find them online most places, but, you know, helping Savas Beatty out, supporting our small publishers is, is a really, really wonderful thing to do. And so if you, if you're going to buy one, I'll point you in that direction. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And thank you all uh, for joining us for this book talk. And I, I see lots of people saying fantastic and fascinating. So uh, once again, Jeffrey Hunt, thank you for joining us. And uh, everyone remember to go to our website, www.acwm.org for more information on future programs. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thank you.